Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our Women and Money series. My name is Jan Mercer-Doms. I'm the Vice President of U.S. Development with the Mayshad Group. Mayshad is an enterprise of brands for women by women dedicated to connecting each other to each other and to the companies, causes, and organizations that champion equity for women professionally and personally. I'm joined today with Neza Alawi, our CEO and founder, along with two rock star female entrepreneurs, funders, philanthropists, Jesse Draper and Diane Johnston. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Diane. And welcome, Neza. Thank you, everyone. We're so happy to be here today. Uh, we're so happy to have more and more exciting speakers. We're going to be speaking to uh, today about a topic that is very dear to our heart as women entrepreneurs. Uh, try to understand how what is the new future, how uh, can we access those funds that are out there to create more female-led companies. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you. Please, everyone who's watching us today, make sure to type in your questions and comments in the chat box and make sure to visit at joinmeshad.com where you can learn all about our upcoming program. We offer now 10 opportunities for you to stay engaged with us each and every single week. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Diane. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Jesse Draper is the founding partner of Halogen Ventures. She's a TV host, an actor, a tech personality, a board member, and has been named to Marie Claire's 50 Most Connected Women in America. So, Jesse, it's clear that we all must know you. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and Diane Johnston. Diane is the Vice President at Bernstein Private Wealth Management with deep expertise with foundations, family offices, endowments, entrepreneurs, and high net worth individuals. She is an author and anti-human trafficking advocate and a celebrated award-winning women in business for making contributions that give back with impact. Hi, Diane. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Diane, question to you first. All right. You and I have been talking about how it seems like we're all much busier now than ever during the pandemic. And it's interesting because today we realize that um, Facebook and Amazon are at all time highs in the market. Yeah. Yet we know the stock market's taking some pretty wild swings right now. And I can imagine this must be a very um, interesting time for yourself and for your clients. Talk to us about what you're seeing right now. What are you finding most interesting in the work that you do with your clients? That's a really broad question, so I'll try to keep it concise and not take up the entire show because I, I could talk for a really long time on, on the markets and what we're doing with our clients. But it's a really, really good time to be planning, um, especially for entrepreneurs and business owners. The uniqueness of this time is that most families are home together and partners are together. So as Jesse can tell you, one of the most important things for founders and entrepreneurs as they're starting their business is to make sure that they have all the right structures in place from a legal structure, mapping out their exit plan and being ready to pull the trigger when it's time to go. Because having a meaningful plan in place can have a significant difference in a post exit transaction. And from a market perspective, you know, you mentioned some solid tech names, you know, no surprise that those are benefiting from working from home. And we're continuing to add to other names in our portfolios that support technology, working from home, and even some things like warehouse REITs, you know, where you're going to see storage of all of the things that consumers are buying. So uh, the nice part about the sell-off is a lot of our portfolio managers had wish lists and it was a time for them to add to some names that you know previously had ticked all the boxes except for valuation. It was a really good time to bolster portfolios with high quality names. Thank you, Diane. Jesse, I'm interested to get your thoughts on this as well. You work with, I think you have about 55 um, companies in your portfolio right now. And as we know, for entrepreneurs and small businesses and companies really actually of all sizes, this time can produce a tremendous amount of stress and strain, but also know that there are some rising stars that are coming out and realizing that this is also an opportunity to create a lot of um, value in the market. What are you seeing in the sense of your aha moments in the work with your portfolio companies right now? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, also just to clarify, I'm a former actress, no longer an actress, <laughs> really, yeah, I'm busy. Um, I am um, Jesse Draper. I run Halogen Ventures. We invest in early stage female founded consumer technologies. 
Um, and yeah, we have about 60 companies now. And, um, you know, I'd say week one, I have so much to respond to about what Diane just uh, mentioned, and I, I'm seeing all the same things. Um, but week one, I felt like I have all these early stage companies and I felt like I was a psychic and I could see the recession before anyone else because our companies will call us early and say, I just took a 50% hit this week because they are smaller and sort of uh, more malleable and the larger companies, you know, take a quarter to catch up basically in terms of numbers. And so um, I was just spinning and I was like oh my god this is going to be so bad and nobody even realizes it and and it is it's bad and it's not it's going to get worse before it's going to get better but what what inspired me after my team we got on the phone with all 60 of our founders in about one week and um we made our recommendations and we said you know do what you need to do to get through January and we made some really solid recommendations that helped them a lot of them got the SBA loan but after talking to them, I was so inspired and I felt so much more optimistic about this, um, obviously, as optimistic as you can um, feel, because I realized entrepreneurs are what is going to pull us back up. Um, they were already way ahead. A lot of them had laid off who they had to lay off or cut salaries in the most thoughtful way possible. Um they were coming up with new products week two, new revenue streams, transferring entire businesses online. Um, and it just, it was so inspiring to see how innovative everyone was being. And I realized that it's not going to be great for business right now, but if everyone can just, in terms of our companies, we've said, if everyone can just survive, don't focus on growth, just focus on survival through January those businesses will help build everything back up. Those businesses will also be 10 times bigger than the ones that um, don't focus on survival and are focused on their growth right now. Um, and so we, you know, I feel really optimistic. We've seen, we, about 20% of our companies are CPG, direct to consumer products. And then the rest is a mixture of media technologies. We have a a sort of FaceTime type app for teenagers called Squad that started taking off. And then Diane, you mentioned everyone should set up their estates and be thoughtful about that if you haven't. Um, we have a company that has taken off called Trust and Will that you can set it up for, uh, you know, $100 online, set up your will. Um, and that they sold more wills last week, sadly, but good for business <laughs> uh, than ever before. Um, and so it's been interesting to see kind of where the ups and downs are. But as an investor, I've been as supportive as we possibly can. Um, we doubled down on our best performers. We hosted pitch days for our investors to invest and support our companies. Um, we put together a list of loans and debt options uh, and lenders that we're constantly updating. Um, we've been tracking the SBA loan daily because I'm sure you're all following that and it's changing daily. Um, and, uh, and so I feel like, and then we got everyone a free hour of PR because if you have a business, um, you should definitely be, uh, if you can't be selling your product, you should certainly be out there talking about it because uh, even our B2B products, I've said things like, even if it, you don't feel like it's a sexy product, get out there and build your brand. <laughs> Everyone's online. Um, and so uh, those are a couple of the things we're doing, but I'm feeling good that we're going to get through this and we have to get through this um and uh we'll get there you know i thank you jesse and i think it's really interesting what you said around being the fortune teller right being the psychic and being able to predict what was going to happen in the sense of then kind of the ripple effects that we're feeling understanding that we know that many many industries and many trends were already at the brink of changing when we think about things that were happening within the sharing economy for example or thinking about you know, the various ways in which retail just transformed itself and not overnight, right? Because in most metropolitan areas, we see the effects of brick and mortar and the shift online and and then bringing into it the, the human, the customer experience as well. And to Diane and to Jesse, to both of you, um, in what ways do you feel like some of these sectors will be able to rebound? Because we, we're seeing so much innovation, Jesse, to your point around innovation in so many other spaces too, in the sense of some really creative 
creative ideas coming to fill the need of what people are experiencing right now. But some of those industries that were already on the verge of mass transformation, what do we think will happen in those cases? Yeah, um, it, it to Jesse's point, you know, a lot of it does feel like whether you have vision or don't have vision. And I would say the one thing that we we keep saying at Bernstein and we were doing pre-COVID is triangulating. You know, you really need to triangulate the data and you need to scrape as much data as you can just to try to get a picture of where you should be positioning yourself. And in general, yes, there are going to be some sectors, again, technology and healthcare. That's you know nothing prescient that none of us um, are unaware of right now. But to the extent that you can diversify yourself is really important. And then thinking even beyond the geography of the United States, you know, the context of our conversation so far has really been around innovation here in our own backyard. But at the same time, you know, many other countries and regions are going through what we're going through right now. So you can expect this innovation to happen globally and you want to make sure that you have that exposure from your investments, at least. Um, so our, our thinking has always been and remains to be that no more than 60 percent of your portfolio should have exposure to the U.S., and then 30% developed and 10% emerging markets. Um, as far as you know, going back to the entrepreneurial side, and I'll kick it back to Jesse after this comment, but I have a really good friend. She is a founder and she has a company called Lance. And that, for example, has seen explosive growth during this period because it specifically addresses the freelancer economy. And you already saw going into COVID, you know, pre people working from home that freelancers were becoming an increasingly important part of the economy here in the US and globally. So much like how you can do your wills online, how can freelancers be supported to take care of their businesses online as well? And to the extent that we're gonna support the economy from a freelance and, and a gig perspective, I think is gonna be very transformative, even more so than it has pre COVID. I completely agree. Um, yeah, I completely agree. And what you mentioned about um, Amazon before too, you know, I was one of those people who during the low, um, I was like, I, I don't have any Amazon, I should probably buy some Amazon and I bought it and I had, I'm not a stock picker, this is not my profession, but a, <laughs> a few of my friends were like, what stocks are you buying? And I said, Amazon, and it, it has gone up so much. And that was not um, you know, it wasn't brain surgery. It wasn't the impression. It was just like, I'm going to use it every single day. And so is everybody else right now. And just thinking about your portfolios that way, where how do you see this changing, I think is, you know, what everyone should be doing. And I encourage all of you incredible women to do that uh, as well, because I think often it's left to um, husbands, at least that's what I found in our business investing in women. Um, and I think it's important that you take control of that too. Yes, Jesse, I, I totally relate on what you said about how entrepreneurs went through this confinement. And uh, yes, at Meshad, I mean, the first thing was to reunite as, as a team. I was so lucky to have a progressive team because of our um, early stage uh, uh, venture, the, the, the team is passionate, everyone wanted to find out the solutions and then we shifted to digital and what really took us, drove us through this was our love for the, the network of women who were out there supporting us through the past year and, and we were immediately thinking of what is the new value that we can bring them. and. Um, so, Jesse, I would like to get to your personal story. So many of us know you as the host of the Valley Girl Show and for your role in Meet the Drapers. Uh, what many of us may not know is that you are a fourth generation venture capitalist with a passion for female founders. Among your portfolio of now 60 companies uh, are Glam Squad, The Scheme. What inspired you to follow in your family's footsteps and what did you choose to make uh, differently? Yeah, it's such a good question. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for having me. This is fun. I love what you're doing too with Meshad. Um, I um, I think connecting women in particular is so important, especially right now. Um, 
Yeah, no. So I started uh, in, so I went to UCLA in 2008. I started um, the first, I was acting clearly. <laughs> and um, I realized that that just wasn't the profession that I uh, resonated with. Um, I had grown up in a very technologically savvy family um, around incredible entrepreneurs and venture capitalists. And I didn't think I could be one of them because I was female and my mom worked incredibly hard raising four children. But the woman in my life who I saw and identified with and, you know, they say you can be what you can see. Um, And my aunt was a very successful actress in the 80s. Her name's Polly Draper. And she uh, is still a very good friend of mine. Uh, She was on a show called 30 something that's coming back to Netflix, actually. Um, But she um, I was like, oh, that's what women do. That's a traditional job for a woman, because as a little eight year old, you're kind of looking up and like, okay, what should I be? So I just had it in my head that I was going to be an actress. Um, Went to UCLA, studied theater, film and television. And I did always have my dad kind of in the back of my head saying, how are you going to make this a business? But again, there were no, you know, he was incredibly generous with his education to me. I'd go to conferences um, with him, but there were no women around me, period, uh, whenever I did that. And so I, I went into acting. I realized quickly it was full of cattle calls where you go into these rooms and you sit there for five hours um, and everyone looks just like you and is probably way more talented. And I, I was like, I'm, I'm a busy person. I just like to stay stay incredibly busy and be doing things all the time. And so I, I said, I can be much more productive than this. And it was early days of YouTube. I started this talk show called the Valley girl show. It was really silly and fun at first. And, um, I started it out of my parents' garage on hiatus from this, um, Nickelodeon show I was on. And I, uh, you know, had my brother's film and it was a complete disaster in the beginning, but it was my beginning of my entrepreneurial journey. I took that show five seasons. Ultimately, we were nominated for an Emmy. Um, and uh, in the beginning, after two seasons online, we um, I realized I'd only interviewed men in technology. And I was really frustrated by that. Um, and at that time, it was about 2010 now, it was really difficult to get women in technology on the show. It was really, really tough to get those Meg Whitmans. It was like pulling teeth. They felt they had worked so hard to get where they were. They didn't want to put themselves out there. And I felt like I was going against the grain saying, no, but women need to see you uh, doing what you're doing uh, in a different profession. And so after two seasons, uh, I made an initiative to interview 50% women in technology and they came. I am forever grateful to the women of fashion tech because once that started booming, I got Jen Hyman from Rent the Runway and the Guilt Girls, and that made it okay for Sheryl Sandberg to come on my show before Lean In, um, and that changed my life. And then it was like Jessica Alba, Mark Cuban, and it just kind of spiraled from there. Um, But what I also realized was it was a bat signal. (laughs) <laughs> there were not enough women looking for women in tech. And it was this magic magnet that pulled just that. Thou- I was getting thousands of pitches for the show. And so I, sometimes I'd say, you're too early for the show. I love what you're doing. Can I write you a pennies check? Um, I had worked with my dad a little bit and sourced deals for him, like Paperless Post and numerous others. Um, and I I knew what a good deal looked like. Uh, And so I'd say, can I write you a pennies check, like $5,000, whatever I can afford. I don't have a ton of money or even just I negotiated sweat equity. Um, And some of those deals ended up doing really well for me. One I sold for a 25X return on the secondary market uh, in less than 18 months. And I quickly realized I... It was early days of digital distribution, but I was working with everyone from Forbes and Mashable to distribute our content to, uh, you know, then we ultimately got to CBS and it was, uh, you know, it was just a tough industry overall. We were barely breaking even media has so many issues. That's a whole nother conversation for another day. If anyone would like to discuss it, (laughs) so many ideas. But um, I realized that my investments were paying off much more so than my show. And I realized I could use the show as kind of like a deal flow opportunity. I then um, sort of set the show aside uh, and I started raising a fund based on my track record. I picked maybe 500 uh, people and closed about 50 of them. Uh, like any good entrepreneur. (laughs) And then uh, now we're on our second fund and 
we have we're continuing to do what we have been doing and we invest there has to be a female in the founding team of five I think I've made the exception beyond co-founders just once because it's never really been an issue. Um, and we're investing in everything from transportation to fashion. And you mentioned a couple of our companies, The Skim, um, Carbon 38, which is an uh, international athleisure marketplace with 250 plus brands um, that uh, is partially owned by Foot Locker. I sit on the board of and um, we're, uh, we're betting on women and they're paying off. Thank you, Jesse, for doing what you're doing. It's such an inspiring story. And, and we realize that whenever we're successful on something, it really comes from a personal journey of getting there and realizing how much impact we can create. Um, Diane, you're a very successful wealth manager in an industry where women are clearly underrepresented. What inspired you to be in this industry and what have you learned about yourself as a female leader and role model in this space? Well, I can tell you that um, things happen by happenstance, you know, not too different from Jesse's story. When you get out of college, you think you're going down one path and it just kind of is a winding road that uh, is a surprise. And that's what the beauty of life is, is all the surprises and the decisions that end up being made for you. And you just have faith that it's gonna go in the right direction. Um, I got out of a small liberal arts school in the South called Swanee, the University of the South with a degree in economics. I honestly didn't think I was gonna put it to use. I just thought it was a good discipline to have because my father was an amazing general practitioner. He's still with us, but he's no longer practicing medicine. And I saw that as a business owner owning his own medical practice that a lot of times there were not great business decisions. So I ultimately did go into finance. I started off in structured finance. Um, to break Oscar Wilde's recommendation, you know, that was in the mid 90s and, and structured finance was uh, not synthetic and it was not all the stuff that got us into the great financial crisis. But as I wove my way through the institutional side of finance, um, 20 some odd years down the road, I realized that my passion really was to help people and that I really was daddy's girl. Um, and that for me, being able to help people with their financial health and make sure not so much that they're getting to the point where they're making it, but making sure that they're not missing out. And for women especially, that trend of missing out can have such a huge impact on their wealth. And of course, that impacts everyone around them, everyone that is in their circle when their wealth is not optimized to be as great as it could be, um, which is what brought me to Bernstein so that I could take care of people's financial health. And in doing that, I think one of the important things is understanding where you are in that advisor wheel and building out what I call my external colleagues and getting the people, you know, Jesse's of the world who have the power and the ability to listen to a female founder and help them get to the right round and get to the right place, making sure that they have the right legal frameworks in place. I opened up with that earlier, but that can be critical and it doesn't have to be expensive. And that's the other thing that I think so many people in general, but especially women, they think they have to reach a certain marker in their life and that they have to have certain things buttoned up, that they have to be educated to a certain degree on you know, the topic that they're addressing, when really they just need to raise their hand and say, hey, I don't know anything about this. Who around me can tell me and who can help me out? And when you can cobble together that team of people helping you out, that's where wealth can really be built. And it, it sounds overly simplistic, um, and I won't dive into the details of it because um, that can be too nerdy and too boring. But, <laughs> you know, my story really came to be because I wanted to help people and I wanted everyone to feel empowered that they, they could ask for help. And no matter what the concept is, no matter how difficult or how uh, sophisticated someone on the institutional side may make it sound, I guarantee you we can distill it into a really easy analogy. I mean, I can't tell you how many times hot sauce has been a good analogy for me <laughs> in investing or, um, you know, a classroom, for example, diversifying your portfolio. A lot of times it's like how you're sitting kids in a classroom to get the right behaviors. 
and just opening up for discussion to get conceptually and understanding the important things for your holistic portfolio, which is a lot more than stocks and bonds to create your wealth. Thank you, Diane. And can you tell us about your passion for ESG? Yes, I would love to. <laughs> um, ESG, also known as environmental, social, and governance, it's uh, a thematic that has come about after the UN came out with 17 sustainable development goals a handful of years ago, and uh, several companies signed and got on board to basically make changes to how they operate uh, to protect our planet and to protect all of the creatures that inhabit the planet. Um, one of the really important things, especially that's been highlighted by this pandemic that we're in right now, is you know ESG companies did not go down as much in performance as the S&P 500. Um, significant percentage points less And another interesting thing, a lot of people confuse ESG with a screening type of investment technique and by screening, you know, removing things from a portfolio. And that's really not what ESG is about. It's about ranking a company and seeing how they're doing. Do they have a diverse board, for example? Um, are they being aware of their carbon footprint? Um, what is their governance? You know, how, what's their ethos as a company? And as companies improve these things within, they almost naturally start performing better and their margins start improving. So we like to tell people that you can actually do good by doing good. You can see really good performance in your portfolio by investing in companies that are trying to do better and operate better. And by default, that comes down to helping the environment and diversification and inclusion and a lot of other wonderful things. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Jesse. You know, I think it's interesting because we're picking up on some common themes here around how we're using this time for ourselves individually as professional women, but then as we also think of just empowering women at a more macro level and helping us think through some of those things that we may have struggled with in the past, particularly around um, decision making, um, perceptions of risk and risk management. And to, to your point around how sometimes women feel like they need to have everything teed up and, and tied up with every I dotted and every T crossed before we take the plunge, right? And then the value of testing and, and then pivoting and reinventing if we need to at that point. But I'm wondering, you know, for each of you in the work that you do, you know, do you see in your work with women, women feeling a bit more comfortable and taking more risks now? Because so much of the world is actually unknown, right? Like we don't know what we're going back to. We don't know what the new world is, but together we can be a part of creating that together, um, but in different ways that also help us understand our own risk preferences. That's great. That's, I feel like that's something I'm always talking to women about. And um, I think we need, we still need women to take a lot more risks. I see it in two ways. One, in our portfolio, um, I'm just proud to invest in women, especially right now, because seeing how they have pivoted, um, you know, the data is there. Women raise half as much capital, double the return. Uh, meaning they're much scrappier, um, they're more profitable, they exit a year earlier in just as large a way. Um, and I, I see that really through our founders. And I do feel like our founders take risks and we bet on the ones, I want women who can walk through fire and who just take that risk. Um, the one founder or one or two that I'm concerned about in our portfolio right now are the ones that are just sitting still saying, we just have to wait until everything opens back up. And I'm like, well, by God, do something, you know, I don't care if it doesn't work out, just do something, take that risk because it may pay off. Um, and I think in terms of our founders, that's what I look for as an investment is the women who are taking the risk. And I feel like I have quoted exactly what you just said, where women do, we, we like our T's, you know, crossed and our I's dotted. And really what we should be doing is just throw paint against a wall. It's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be perfect. And I see it even with our founders where they'll, they're like, you know, but our next prototype is going to be a lot better. And, um, this isn't, 
quite what I want you to see. It's not ready yet. I'm like, it's always going to have another prototype coming. There's always going to be a better model. So just get out there. You'll learn so much more if you just take that risk. The, the place I would love to see more risk taken, and um, by the way, I actually have quite a few Bernstein clients invested in our fund. I'm a huge fan of Bernstein. They're very <laughs> um, They have incredible female clients, which not all private wealth management groups have. Um, and I, I just think they're, they're a fantastic group that I work very closely with. Um, but in terms of the LP or my investors, um, it's been frustrating for me because when I went out and raised my first fund, I said, okay, I'm going to go pitch all the female billionaires. I'm going to go find them. I'm just going to like knock down the list. And I'm not saying I easily met with all of them, but I did get to meet with quite a few. Um, and the majority of them and just women of that stature feel more comfortable writing multi-million dollar checks to charity. And there is a place and a time to invest in uh, nonprofits and give. I am giving as much as I can right now. I think there's definitely a time and a place for that. But when you look at the big picture, men control the majority of the capital. And so I just feel that women should be trying to, we should at least be on a level playing field before giving the majority of it away. So I would have these meetings over and over. You know, private wealth manager introduces me to very qualified uh, female investor and I have six meetings and I, you know, they're hemming and they're hawing. And then I finally get to, you know, the heart of it. And they say, you know, I just don't know enough about venture capital and I don't want to make a bad investment. And I'm like, well, how, first of all, this is not going to be a bad investment. <laughs> Second of all, <laughs> how do you learn if you don't take that risk? You just told me how you wrote a $3 million check to this charity you're incredibly passionate about. Like, this actually is making an impact and making money for both you as well as other women. Um, and that this will get their business off the ground. They will sell their business for a billion dollars and invest it back into that more diverse uh, ecosystem. And um, I now I now have been, I just, I don't feel like philanthropists are our target, um, but also I find that women say, you know, at that sixth meeting, they'll say, actually, I think I want you to meet with my husband now. And it's like, this is your money too. You know, you can make this decision as well. Um, and so we've actually integrated a lot of education around investing in our fund now because we realized so many women just felt like they didn't understand it. I'm going to tell you all a little secret. It's just gambling. It's like throwing money down on a blackjack table. And it and we are, first of all, women are more educated. We're taking, we have much more emotional intelligence. We are taking many more factors into account than our significant others or the other sex. Um, so you should just be confident in whatever decision you make. Take risk with your capital. You know, Invest in some stocks. If you like Starbucks, buy some Starbucks stock. You know, just do things that you understand. Buy some Bitcoin because that's one to 17 uh, in terms of women and men right now. <laughs> and you don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin. You can buy a piece of a Bitcoin. But I think that there's, you know, just take that risk because you're not going to learn unless you do it. So I think we do still need women to take more risk. But there's women out there leading the way for sure. Jesse, that is such an incredible point you just made. And thank you so much for the work that you do in mentoring and um, advising and educating women. Because I think that this is, uh, so many different levels this is needed from how we spend to how we save to how we invest to how we even shop around for jobs, right? And, and you know, we've heard so many times that women feel like they're not qualified, they're not qualified, they're not qualified. When the fact of the matter is, there's such a different gender mindset around how men think they're qualified versus how a woman feels like she's not qualified. Um, Jesse, one thing that you said that I thought was really interesting as well is the, the, the correlation to the philanthropist giving and the ease by which women give to nonprofit organizations and then the mental block that arises when then they venture into possibly capital raising. Yeah. And you're right. The risk is, you know, there's a risk that when you give in the nonprofit sector, I spent 10 years of my career in the nonprofit sector. I know that sometimes invest, uh, funders give without really feeling certainty that tangible outcomes are going to come from that giving. Right. 
Um, but there is this, this psychology around money that women have where it's much easier from the place of nurturing to give back to the world if you think you're going to make the world a better place than to give to a business, to an entrepreneur, to a team. But now I'm wondering if this is a great moment in time to shift that mindset because of Diane, what you were saying earlier around the, the, the expansion of ESGs and how we think about it, it's not just an exclusion. It's not just an exclusion from alcohol, tobacco, firearm stocks, but there's so much more now that's a part of the common conversation around how one invests with their, with their soul, with their, their, their passions. And is this seeing in the work that you do as well, because you do work with foundations and endowments and wondering if you're seeing that, that mind shift as well. Yeah, um, I think the, yes on all of the above. And I think a couple of things to, to weave in that Jesse mentioned as well is, you know, the nature of women giving, Jan, as you noted, tends to be altruistic mm -hmm. when you're giving to an endowment or foundation. That charitable giving tends to come from a place of nurture. It, it tends also to come from um, a bias that it's familiar. And so there, there are a lot of behavioral biases that are entrenched in finance that um, impact both men and women, but can impact women more. So familiarity is one of them. And that's where you see an increase in, in giving to charities. And their male counterparts tend to give to charities because they get a tax benefit or they get recognition. So I think one, allowing women to know they can give both to VCs and they can be an LP and they can also use things like a donor advised fund to give to charities and do all of this for a tax benefit and to increase their wealth and to diversify their portfolios and that it's a strategy that their male counterparts would use is a good thing and it's a tool that we need to educate more women on um, and the sooner we can do that the better and also there you know it's a, it's a two-sided coin in a good way um giving to charities is a great thing for founders to do especially as jesse said women exit a year earlier when there's a female founder in the mix you tend to see an exit a year earlier so if they do have a donor advised fund set up those have a great anonymity they can um, give easily to charities and they can donate the shares from their company ahead of an exit and that reduces their tax impact when they sell so um, i hope that there's an increase to both sides of the coin i hope people start giving more to charities with for females because it's efficient and they should do it for their portfolios and i also hope that more people start giving to female founder investing in female founded businesses because that helps diversify their investments they can feed each other. It can, it can keep yeah. going in a good way. I love thinking about it that way too. I never sort of dissected um, our female minds that way where it is, it has personally, it's taken me a long time to learn, like if I invest this money, I should get something in return. Um, and now I actually even think about it with our founders where a couple of years ago I invested in, wrote sort of a larger check than we typically do in a company. And they just blew through it. And I had to come in and say, oh my goodness, what were you doing? We were, you know, you should have cut your costs. You should have done this. And um, now when we invest, I say, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to hire a new COO. I want you to cut your burn by 50%. And I want, you know, it's like what it, you can get something for that. Thank you, Thank Diane. You. Thank you, Jesse. I would love to talk to both of you um, a little bit about what we're doing and what you think is missing in the sphere of women's networking, women empowerment, uh, and, and to talk about it really like with what is happening now and, and the future of consumers' behavior, of all society problems and employments and so on. Um, yeah, yesterday, I was in a conversation on a pitch with a woman who um, told us that we should be going more on an elite niche rather than trying to, to, to have a, a more scalable uh, business model and that memberships are no trendy, not trendy anymore. When we believe really that, first of all, 
what will make our network scalable is the diversity in it. The fact that we're across industries, because it's that richness that is going to give an ecosystem to women to find the different resources that they want. The, the younger talent to find uh, fundraising, the, the, the more senior women to find a talent to hire, and, and creating that, that diversity where moving forward, I think that all the, the known stereotypes are becoming unknown. We're all advancing in an unknown world. And if we can question ourselves in a more diverse group, I think we'll get to more uh, innovative um, solutions. So, so what do you think is missing out there on, on the networking space and what could make uh, a successful business model? I mean, personally, I would tier it, um, but I believe the best businesses are, like everyone can be a customer. I don't think that um, elite is necessarily the way uh, to go. You know, I always think like one of our first biggest exits, I sold a um, a tampon company to P&G called This Is L and everyone, use, well, all women use tampons and that's not going to stop. Um, and so you think, I like products like that, that can be um, applicable to everyone because if everyone can be a customer, it will be a bigger business. Sure. It'll be it's much more likely a billion dollar market where if you're servicing this, um, you know, tiny, like elite crew. And I also kind of feel like the elite have a lot of these networking things and don't utilize them as much as everybody. Um, and I think that you should, yeah, have, have it tiered and definitely everyone needs this, especially women. So I think make it as big as you can. Thank you. I concur on the tiering, and I think that helps also access what you were saying, the diversity. Um, yeah, some passion about ESG, a huge part of that is diversity and inclusion. And I think as women, we all know that, you know, we tend to lean on our friends and ask people for their opinions. And if you make something too narrow or you get too niche, um, whereas you may see profitability more quickly or you may see higher margins sooner, I think you diminish your brain trust. And I think the beautiful thing of what you're trying to do is build a great brain trust. Um, so I agree. I love the tiering idea. And I love it being open to everybody, you know, not just women. I love the women and those who support women. And I and I like the trend that I've been seeing over the past, say, 36 months of, you know, inviting people to the table who are going to hold each other up. And that's the best way to get good output and good diversity. Diane, I love the phrase you just used, brain trust, because we actually have Mayshad brain trust circles that we <laughs> run each and every week. <laughs> <laughs> for our very diverse network to come together. And what I think is really interesting about that, that um, product that we offer as a part of our membership is that it really truly does bring together women from really diverse industries, really diverse job functions, diverse professional and personal experiences. And the, the conversations so far have been incredible. And I think that for us, what we're also seeing in this moment in time is that there's a richness that's coming out in our ability to be present with each other online as opposed to in person. And don't get me wrong, I'm an extrovert. I cannot wait for the day when we go back and host Mayshad events live. But honestly, there's something, cause look, like we're all seeing what, how we live and we're, we're peering into each other's worlds. And I think that, you know, as we let the roots come in and we're not wearing makeup every day and we may be more casual, there's also a bit more of our authentic selves that are coming through. And that's lending itself to some really rich conversations around what do women really need to survive right now, but then what do we need to thrive going forward? And we're finding that women really are not just to your point of, you know, the division that you're seeing between those entrepreneurs that are waiting for something to happen, waiting for it to rebound versus those that are taking action and going out there and creating it for themselves. That's what we're seeing in our conversations as well is that women, I think now more than ever, are willing to take more risk and to put themselves out there and to think about what comes next because we're not, we know that we're not going back to what it was, right? There's just, there's no way possible, maybe in a few years, but I think the learning lessons that we realize from this moment in time will forever shift how we think about all things related to climate change and sustainability and, 
you know, life work and, you know, how we give back in the world that we really want to, to create for ourselves and our legacy. And Diane, to that point around legacy, you know, it, you spoke a lot in the beginning around just, you know, how as we as individuals, no matter if we're corporate executives, entrepreneurs, business owners need to think about mitigating risk right now and, and having those protections in place. Let's talk a little bit more about that and what advice you have. We have a wonderful mix of corporate executives and entrepreneurs and, and owners who are watching the show today and investors too. Um, and, you know, want to make sure that we're giving some real tactical advice for, you know, from your perspective, what are the things that may have fallen through the cracks for many of us that we particularly right now should be paying attention to? I think one of the bigger areas, especially for women, because we're we're blessed with having a long lifespan, is that women from, again, that legal support that you can put in place for yourself. Um, they don't insure themselves necessarily in the appropriate way, and there are a lot of pivot points in a woman's life where health costs could weigh. They, it could either it could destroy wealth very quickly if you don't have a long-term care plan in place. Um, it also can, a lot of times women are called upon to be a caregiver when a family member is sick. So if you don't have yourself set up to have insurance in place to maybe a parent or making sure that their health care is taken care of. Um, there are things like a power of attorney. You know, if God forbid, I think we've all, you know, Jesse's point earlier, one of her companies has seen a huge increase in wills online. And yes, we should all have wills. Um, I shared with you, Jan, a, a stat earlier that only 36% of parents with children under the age of 18 have wills. If something happens to you and you have assets, even if it's not a lot of assets, but if you have an idea of where you want those assets to go, you should protect them by, by putting a plan in place. Um, for people who are going through difficult times like a divorce, it can be important to understand what your healthcare coverage is going to be. You know, do, do you have access to COBRA? Make sure you don't wait around because that window can close on you very, very quickly. Um, if you're a founder or entrepreneur or even not, and you're thinking about getting married, I, I think millennials are great about putting prenups in place. They uh, do it as a knee jerk almost. It's like something that you should do, but I think um, Gen Xers are, are not as good about doing that. So definitely protect yourself with a prenup and um, ask, you know, ask your, your trusted advisors, hey, this is what I'm thinking in the next, not the next five years, but the next 20 years, the next 30 years. I mean, the more people push out their time horizon and think further down the road, the more they'll get the right protections in place. Jesse, what I'm interested in also um, piggybacking on Diane's comments, are you also recommending different things now than before to the female founders that you work with from that due diligence and compliance perspective as well, helping them to understand um, how to build a more sustainable um, um, compliant company? Well, I do make them promise that they'll sell it for a billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and I make them promise that they will then become one of my investors. So I think Diane and I are sort of on the same page. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I think they're. I mean, everything. I I was fascinated by the um the prenup situation because I'm also like, oh, I should go call my will company and make sure that that's one of the offerings. <laughs> yeah. Should we go to questions from the from the audience? Oh. Excellent. Okay, everyone. So thank you again for, for staying with us today. And this is, I know that we can continue this conversation for hours and hours and hours um, and want to make sure that we're listening to you as well. So please make sure to send us your questions in the chat. We have questions already coming in. Uh, number one. Um, okay. According to a recent American Express report, Female-owned businesses have grown 21% between 2014 and 2019. The number of businesses owned by women of color grew 43%. How do you account for such a huge percentage in, short of what, in such a short period of time? What factors are at play, do you think? I'd be curious what types of businesses, because I don't think it's grown 
that much in my industry. Um, and, and I hope it grows more, especially when it comes to women of color. Um, we, I feel very, I, I'm really proud of the fact that we went off of the traditional Sand Hill Road, Silicon Valley investment path and called to women everywhere and looked for the best companies. And we have over 50% minority led companies um, because we were just looking for the best and making sure that there was a female in the team. Um, so I think that those numbers really need to change. Um, still, I can't believe that that's like, I don't know. I'm going to go look at that study because I just, I, that sounds fantastic, but I don't <laughs> think that's true in my business. I think it, it definitely, to your point, varies by industry and American Express, I'm assuming this is with their, their small business initiative that the, yeah. the, um, the viewers referring to. And what we, what I know did happen and Diane would be interested to get your points on this as well. Your thoughts, 2007, 2008 marked, you know, the financial collapse as we know. And for many women that also triggered a mark at times during massive layoffs. Um, and we saw, you know, New York City and, you know, most of the other country um, affected in the same way as well, in the sense of huge numbers of women being furlough, furloughed and laid off. And we're seeing that now as well in 30, what is it? I think we're up to 38 million unemployed Americans as of this morning. Women are overrepresented in every one of those industries, right? In every, every um, unemployment category. And wondering, Diane, from your perspective, is that what triggered, you know, back in 2007, 2008, and then potentially going forward, more women launching small businesses? Um, and is there, did that come out of economic necessity? Or was there awakening that women had that, hey, I no longer kind of fit into that corporate box. Let me go out and create something for myself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that... Well, one, from a financial perspective, you know, this crisis, this pandemic is is very, very different. And I and I think as a globe, um, we learned a lot in 2008, you know, this is not a, a financial crisis per se, even though our economy is being crushed um, in the second quarter and likely some into the third quarter as well. But here in the U.S., it took us over four years to get one and a half trillion in stimulus during the financial crisis. It took us a handful of weeks to get over two trillion in stimulus in the beginning of this COVID pandemic. So I think to the extent that people are able to take unemployment benefits now in a way that they couldn't before, that many small businesses have received uh, loans that hopefully will, I know it doesn't work for a lot of sectors like restaurants, for example, examples, gotten a lot of press on why it's not working and the independent restaurant tours are being hurt very much. But I think in any crisis, you know, the saying of, you know, don't let a good crisis go to waste. And that's where the entrepreneurial spirit is born. And quoting back to the number of full-time employees versus the growth of freelancers, I do think as people are at home or quarantined or they see a need that hasn't been there before, that we will continue to have a rise in the entrepreneurial spirit and, and hopefully see some amazing things. Um, I know you listen to, well, I know Jesse was a guest on some of the uh, Bernstein Women in Wealth podcasts, but you know, for example, they had a really interesting story about a woman who started a business, you know, getting devices to hospitals. You know, she pivoted very quickly and during this time it's exploded. So, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I think it's, I think it's an interesting moment in time. And I think that women are very skilled at seeing what's missing, right? We're, we're very attuned to what's not out there and where the gaps are because we experience those gaps for ourselves, right? And I think that's what happened in 2007, 2008. I um, mean, it definitely is happening now, which leads to the next question from our audience around women working within the home. And we've heard from many women, including women in our network, that, you know, there's um, uh, much more work that's happening now for them as they're maintaining their careers from a remote work perspective, but the work that they're actually now doing in the home typically is considered, you know, unpaid labor, right? When we think about child rearing, but many of us are homeschooling right now and um, professional women, you know, may have lost um, nannies or daycare opportunities or, you know, housekeepers or gardeners or whatever it usually takes to ha have a household be maintained. Um, and, 
women at different lower socioeconomic levels and women of color, you often worked and have known this for many, many, many decades. Um, but now there's a different socioeconomic class is actually coming to realize that there's a tremendous amount of labor that it takes to sustain one's work, home, life. And um, this reader refers to the statistic that, um, you know, if you calculate the value of um, a woman's work within the home, a house, housewife's work, for example, is about $165,000 a year. <laughs> and so now that many women are maintaining that balance within the home and um, most of those responsibilities do fall on the shoulders of women in the household. Do you think there'll be more attention paid to how we value work within the home? And what are the lasting ripple effects of that then, if so? I certainly, I mean, I certainly value it. And um, I have to say my husband, I have two little kids and my husband has really, we've been two working parents for, um, you know, a long time. And he really does, I think, do 50% of the workload, although it never feels that way. But I think husbands have really had to step up through this. And I'd just like to give a plug to um, this book I read called Fair Play. So if anyone out there is looking for more help from your spouse, you should read this book. Um, she basically breaks down all of the work in the home that goes unnoticed. And it ends up being this list of 1,400 things or something. And then you put them on, um, she breaks them into categories and you put them on little flashcards and then you go through it with your husband or significant other partner. Uh, and um, you break it up and you talk about each one to see whose responsibility it is. And I have to say that has solved a lot of the problems in my personal household. Um, but so I highly recommend that, but I think it will be much more valued. And I also think we will have, I just heard yesterday from one of our founders that she's hiring. Um, she has a mom focused product and she is hiring a whole bunch of stay at home moms to do the work. I also believe that stay at home moms can get more done than probably any of us because they are just the most efficient human beings in the world. Um, and so I think that they work harder, they're more organized. You know, they say give a busy person something to do and they'll get it done in five minutes. Um, so that's not the saying, that's just how I remembered it. <laughs> but um, I, mean, I definitely believe more value will be put on this. And I think our lives will be, well, this will be normal. We'll be able to take these calls from home. And um, if we have a crazy sort of driving all over the place day, we could probably have more of a choice now in terms of, hey, can I take today from home and do all of my work remotely, I think I'll be much more productive because it looks like if I'm driving everywhere, I won't have time to get all those emails done. Um, so I'm excited. And I don't know about you guys, but I used to hide my kids in the closet all the time on Zoom calls. And now they pop in and it's normal. And it's like, it's like we've accepted that people have families. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. I, I agree. I think that um, being able to work more organically, if you will, and, and having interruptions not being embarrassing, and it kind of goes back to women wanting to have everything buttoned up and perfect. And I think through this crisis, we're all realizing that our lives are a bit of a hot mess and beautiful all at the same time. And, um, and that's okay. And, that, and that's a good thing. I also think, you know, just extrapolating a little bit, well, one, if your work is worth $165,000 back to making sure you put protective measures in place, you need, you need to protect that value. Um, two, I think I'd say I, I would to 200. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Of, I mean, that's a lot. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm very eager to read that book. Thank you for the recommendation. And I, and I think, too, like mental load, like that's another cognitive issue that women face. And um, I, my husband's a, a professor and he teaches four classes full time. And it used to be great because he would drive to the school and he had more flexibility in the mornings and in the evenings. But now with everything going online, I mean, he was working like crazy hours to get more for full-time college courses to being online content. And 
Um, I lost a, a lot of that support. And while he's willing to still, I mean, very eager to support, and he's he's allowed me to be a career woman, without a doubt, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing without him. Um, the mental load of having to tell somebody, like, this is what I need from you, and this is what would be helpful. I think if you could sit down with those flashcards and flesh it all out and eliminate that, you know, mental checklist that you have will really help women fly. We have time for one more question and that's around asking for money. And we know that women often have a hard time asking, right? And, you know, there are statistics that indicate that, you know, when a woman graduates from college and she negotiates her first raise or her first, uh, her first uh, job, she normally does not negotiate her compensation. And that $1,200 variance, which is on average the disparity between what a man's offered as his first job versus what a woman's offered for her first job, knowing that there are discrepancies across industry, of course, but over time by retirement grows to almost a million dollars, right? So as we end the show today, we also know that, you know, we still own, earn 78 cents to every man's dollar that um, there are fewer VCs in the in our country, and then that results in fewer funds getting into the hands of females founders. Um, and we also know that there are disparities just across the board in so many other spaces as well, including how how equity is negotiated for a company. Let's talk a little bit about that as we close, because as we think about um, for those of us out there who are growing and scaling businesses negotiating equity is a critical component of how we think about ownership, right? And Diane, to your point around saving for the future, making sure that, you know, we're acting to our best interests as it pertains to, you know, our legacy. Advice that you have for us on that level? So many questions in there. Um, <laughs> I think I'll take the equity portion. Um, look at, if you're giving away equity for your company, um, Look at it like, I always say, cutting off your toe. Uh, you don't want to give away too much. It should be painful for you physically to give away that um, piece because you know what you're going to do with your company and you know how much you plan on selling it for or you know taking it public or what have you. Uh, and you know what you want to walk away with. That said, you know most people don't have a million dollars in their back pocket to start their business. So they do need to give something away. And in terms of going out and fundraising, I get so frustrated when we get a pitch from someone and they say, well, everyone said no. Like everyone just, everyone said no. And I say, okay, well, how many people did you talk to? And they say, well, I talked to eight investors. And I'm like, okay, you should plan on talking to 100 investors. If every single one says no, and probably at about 50, you'll realize something's going wrong with the business that you need to address. Um, then you should feel like, okay, I need to actually like change my business or pivot my business somehow. But if you plan on having 100 meetings, you will find the money. Don't look at it as like this horrible thing that people say no. I feel lucky that I was in acting first because I got so many no's. <laughs> it doesn't even affect me. Um, but I think you, you just, I look at it like I, you know, when I was fundraising, I had this meeting with Diane von Furstenberg. And I was sitting there and I was like, I don't even know how I got here. I don't even care if she's best. Like, this is the coolest meeting I've ever had, you know? And, you you know, I had this one-on-one -on -one hour with Diane von Furstenberg, and I thought that was just the coolest thing. And I think that's how you should look at fundraising. You get to meet with interesting people. You get to learn something. If they don't invest, you'll know pretty quickly. Um, and so don't get, you know weighed down by the nose, look at those as a moment to learn and say, okay, well, why not? And often when you ask why they aren't going to invest in you, they'll say things like, well, I'm not liquid, meaning I don't have the cash on hand. And it's like, oh, okay, well, I'll come back to you in a year or whatever after you sell some stock or what have you, or, um, you know, we're too heavy in consumer technologies and we're looking to diversify and be more invested in life sciences. Like you realize it has nothing to do with you or your business. Um, and so just really listen to all of that feedback and don't be afraid to ask why, uh, or at the end of my first meeting, which I learned with all of the lovely philanthropic investors I met with, 
at the end of my first meeting now, I say, so is this interesting to you? Is it interesting enough for me to send you the data, data room? Because in that moment, you'll have an inkling if they're interested or not. And your time is very valuable in this process. So make sure that um, you're using it wisely. And if they kind of hesitate, they're probably not going to invest. Um, but don't get weighed down. Look at it. This is an amazing opportunity. You get to meet with all of these people. Yeah. Thank you, Jesse. I love all of that. And I love the, the EQ things. I mean, again, the, the fun part of what I do is getting to break things down and into analogies for people. And also millennials and Gen Z, I love them for bringing authenticity to the table as heavily as they have. I think, you know, like a Gen Xer like me, it took me a while to get comfortable with, okay, I can be who I am, whether I'm at home or in the office or talking to a new prospect, like it's Diane Johnston, the same person around the clock. And I think that's really important into being able to make an ask. And um, I often tell my friends and my, and my sisters, hey, you know, if you are advising one of your own friends or one of your kids or somebody, you know, you deserve this, go forward with confidence and ask for it. Here are all the reasons why you should do it. You're a great person. Go get them. Look in the mirror and tell yourself the same thing because the advice rings true no matter no matter what you're doing or what you're asking for. And sometimes just, you know, baby stepping up to that ask is really helpful. One thing that I've been doing during this period is I've been having more Zoom meetings is I will let my colleagues know when we're getting in, A, this is the agenda, and B, think about what you want to ask for because we're not leaving until you ask for something. So every day, get used to asking for something, whether it's asking the attendant at the gas station um, for something more that seems daring than you normally would have, or asking your kid or your partner, whomever it is, just get used to asking. And then it becomes a very natural process. And then you don't feel like you have to deserve something before you ask for it. Cause it's that, it's that sense of, oh, I don't deserve this. That holds so many people back. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Jesse. Excellent advice. And I would like to ask you both to come back because we have so much more to talk about. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Neza. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And Anytime. please make sure to, to stay with us at joinmayshad.com. That's joinmayshad, M-A-Y-S-H-A-D.com. Um, we have one more event on Thursdays celebrating women with a cocktail. Come join us after work today at 5 p.m. You can learn more about this and all of our other events on our site. Thank you, everyone. Oh, subscribe to our YouTube as well. Thank you so much. See you soon, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. This was fun. I appreciate it. So great. Thanks. Thanks, Diane. Thanks, Jesse.